My name is Lowe Vanderhoff. I'm the president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors. And I would like to welcome all of you uh, and the candidates who are here to, uh, to witness this uh, candidate forum for City Council District 5. Um, we, are, we are very grateful for our co-sponsors, include Carnegie Hill Village, City Toss, East 86th Street Association, Friends of the Upper East Side, and health advocates. Uh, I want to uh, express our gratitude to the candidates here assembled. And uh, you will each be given a chance to introduce yourself, so I'm not going to, want to get right into it. And uh, we want to thank Roger Clark uh, of New York One, who has so kindly uh, agreed to, uh, to be the uh, host and question, the moderator of this event. And um, I think we all recognize that New York City, and especially this, this area, faces huge issues. Uh, this is one of the most important elections. And so I think, uh, I think the candidates will speak to that. And we are all concerned about, about a better New York, which is on the horizon if we grasp it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Joanna Collin for the fantastic job, our executive director, Joanna Collin, for the fantastic job she has done to organize this, to assemble the candidates, and get the word out, and, uh, and, uh, and get Roger Clark to agree. <laughs> and um, and uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to you, Roger, and uh, let you vote on. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it is absolutely an honor. Um, I moved to the neighborhood of the district about 10 years ago from Queens. Sorry. That's where I grew up in Farm Hills. But it's, I've, I've grown to, to love this neighborhood so much. Uh, everything about it, you know, raising my son here. And uh, it's great. So, and of course, I'm interested in everything you guys have to say because it's my, it's my neighborhood. Yeah. So that's it. So let's talk about what we're going to do. I mean, basically, we'll introduce everybody a chance to kind of introduce yourself to the folks at home and everybody here. And then we'll have a little fun with a little quick little lightning round just to kind of talk about, you know, lighten things up a little bit. And then we'll get to the big issues, uh, you know, we're covering safer streets, zoning, land use, overdevelopment, all the things that are really important to us here in District 5 for the City Council seat. So without further ado, second safer streets and quality of life question, and this is to talk about short-term and long-term plans on petty crimes uh, that, you know, the great kind of our sense of safety in our streets gave you have shoplifting, people smoking weed in the streets, public indecency, fair evasion, loitering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things we're seeing a lot these days, it seems like, even in our neighborhood. How do you plan to help communities take their streets back? And we're gonna do the flip flop and start with building stuff. Great. So to get real public safety on these types of crimes, we have to recognize that incarceration simply does not work. Recidivism rates are far too high when someone commits shoplifting, petty larceny, uh, loitering, and the like. We do know, however, what does work. What works are programs called pretrial diversion programs that help get people back on a better path. In fact, uh, studies have shown that people who participate in a pretrial diversion program for crimes such as these recidivate at a two to three percent rate. That, to me, if we're talking about real public safety, is real public safety. And by the way, think about the alternative. If we're going to incarcerate someone on Rikers Island, it costs us $1,200 per night to lock someone up on Rikers Island. There are better paths, there are better alternatives. It will save us money as taxpayers, and it will keep us safe, truly, as a city. Rebecca? Again, to me, the root cause of all of these issues is socioeconomic, and I'm not going to be here to ever criminalize poverty. So if someone's shoplifting, I do support what we've done in bail reform. We need to be looking at the root cause, as I just said. We need to look at why someone is in this situation economically. Do they have good housing? Do they have a job? Were they able to get their high school diploma or GED? I personally worked with formerly incarcerated, <laughs> excuse me, formerly incarcerated individuals, helping them secure jobs within the unionized building trades. And as Billy said, when you give someone an opportunity and create a different path for them, the cycle of recidivism is virtually eliminated. And that's what I want to be moving towards. Real public safety, where we're meeting people's needs in those areas instead of over-policing our streets. And also, specifically, when it comes to cannabis 
Anywhere you can't smoke a cigarette, you can't be smoking cannabis publicly on the street. So that's just about public education, in my opinion, not something where we're going to go around and recriminalize people for something that's now going to be legal to do starting in 2022 and has really harmed so many New Yorkers, not New Yorkers that look like me, white people, the data shows are using cannabis more, but black and brown New Yorkers that are largely incarcerated for it. Julie? So one of the things that I think we need to recognize is public safety and meaningful criminal justice reform are actually not mutually exclusive. We can do both. One of the things that we need to get to when you're talking about, for example, turnstile jumping, public urination, these are not being prosecuted by the DA's office. I worked extensively with the Manhattan DA's office. I don't believe that is honestly where we should be focusing. I think instead what we should focus on is summer youth employment. Uh, last year, the city council cut over 70,000 jobs many of whom are to at-risk youth. We need to reinvest uh, into at-risk youth and make sure that it is a priority for the next city council. So that is how I believe that we need to do it. At the same time, of course, we need to support our small businesses. So crimes against small businesses are an issue. We need to make sure that we're supporting our small businesses. So I think it's really taking that kind of approach. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, look, First and foremost, let me say that I think in terms of what our priorities need to be, um, I think the priorities need to be on things like serious crimes such as gun violence. I think that we need to take very seriously many of the hate crimes that we've been seeing in our community, particularly anti-Asian hate crimes, um, the anti-Semitic crimes that we've seen uh, particularly over the last few weeks. And so I, I do believe that that needs to be where our priorities are right now. In terms of the lower level offenses, I know Rebecca already mentioned that marijuana is now legal to, to smoke uh, as, per, as per state law. Um, with regard to things like shoplifting, look, uh, small businesses are an incredibly important part of my platform, something that I care about deeply. We do not want to be hurting our small business owners who are affected by things like shoplifting, but I do believe, as Billy said, programs like diversion programs, which district attorneys and judges have the authority to, to, to put folks into, are a way that we can try to stop the cycle um, of, of crimes like these, rather than putting people in jail where they could potentially you know, be subjected to more trauma, potentially end up you know, um, we be doing these crimes even more. I think that we can cut down on recidivism by focusing on diversion programs and, and focusing on educating people on and getting them the economic help they need to, to, to move forward in their lives. Christian? Yeah, I think that the best way to reduce petty crime in our neighborhood and in any neighborhood is to really create activated streets that people want to be on. And that, that means really taking a kind of multi-layered intersectional approach, which is which is the type of approach that I would be pushing forward. I think that people want to be on streets with that have open, flourishing uh, restaurants and small businesses. I think they want to be on green streets that have plenty of, of, acti of green, uh, green infrastructure around. I think that they don't want to see garbage, and they want to have pedestrian-friendly, safe seat streets. All of those things are the intersection of transportation, small business, um, parks and open space, and so much more. And that's really the, the way I believe that we reduce petty crime. I think that's the way that we get our small businesses back, frankly. And I think that's the way that that's that intersectional approach that I think best takes care of this community. Chris? Yes, I, I think it's really interesting to contrast this question with the last in the terms of what you hear from my friends here, which is, you know, like Julie and I have very deep disagreements on issues of policing, but when it comes to this issue, uh, there's a lot of agreement across the board that we're dealing with a situation where children um, oftentimes are not receiving the support that they need and they're heading towards these behaviors that degrade the safety of the community and frankly put themselves in danger as well. In addition to that, it has a negative impact on the local economy when you're dealing with issues like shoplifting. So we need to focus on those core issues and ensure that we're um, properly taking care of our kids. That includes summer employment, it includes summer programming for children, and it also includes um, a deeper commitment to fighting poverty because poverty is the source of most of these problems. Program according with each scenario, and they reported one crime, one crime last year. This is a good model that we need to copy. Their first goal is educating the public. For instance, they say pot smoking is legal in New York City and the regulation is similar for regular smoking. If a person is a first time offender, they let him go with a warning and if he repeats, 
then he will be ticketed. The police office should carry on cameras at all times. In short, we need to emulate the Roosevelt Island Police Department. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, so we're going to go on to our next question and with the next topic, uh, zoning land use over building. Very near and dear to uh, Carnegie Hall neighbors, of course. So we'll start with uh, Marco. Concerning, you now let's talk about the Longfellow New York Blood Center proposal over on E67. It's a lot zoned for 75 feet. They want to build a 334 foot tower, which is tall. I'm bad as that, but that sounds taller. Um, if you're in the city council, how do you thwart this kind of project and similar projects like that? This is why I am running for city council, because my skills as an architect and planner and a community oriented person, we need a comprehensive plan with accountability on the decision makers. Once a district is protected or, or has two protections, the opportunity to change it will be minimum. For instance, if a district has a cultural, architectural, and historical heritage status, it will be preserved and protected. Thank you. Chris? Oh my gosh, where to start? <laughs> um, first of all, we have this broken Euler process that really just prioritizes developers, even though that's, that's not the program's intent. We really need to work on that. But on a, a very personal, you know, specific level for this community, uh, you're seeing a lot of engagement around stopping this tower, and it's for a number of reasons. One, uh, the Blood Center, in conjunction with this development organization, is uh, essentially barreling over the community, which is something you just cannot do. And they're asking for us to violate an existing precedent that's been here since the mid-1980s to put up this tower that essentially just adds more commercial space is unnecessary and negatively impacts students with autism who are in a educational complex right across the street. So my hope is that by time one of us is seated next year, we're not dealing with this any further because it's absurd that this has gone on so long. And I think what we need are people who are able to organize their communities well, who are able to get a lot of buy-in from local elected officials. I mean, uh, Councilmember Kalos has done wonderfully, and Carolyn Lowe has been working hard on. And I think we also Hi. need to continue to have uh, this level of community engagement. Please come to community board meetings, folks, if we need you. Treasure. Yes, so I am currently the first vice chair of Community Board 8. Uh, this evening, I plan on voting against this project in my capacity as a community board member. Excuse me. Um, and we, I was very proud that my community board already passed a resolution on this, passed through my committee, opposing this project just on the basis of its impact on St. Catharines Park alone. Now, the question is about how do we fight this and how, and how do we get basically the larger city council to see the meaning, the meaning behind this. And that's really where coalition building uh, comes into play. Now, the blood center project is most problematic in its precedent that it sets for zoning. The change from an RAP to, to a C27 would be catastrophic for other areas, not just in our district, not just in our neighborhood, but throughout the city. What they're trying to do is really trying to formatively change our zoning and how we think about a pr preservation of our mid-block zones. And so that's the message that I'm going to be bringing to the city council and to my other to other council candidates, that this could happen not just in my neighborhood, but in anybody's neighborhood, and we need to stand against it for those reasons. Okay. So in terms of this particular project, I think council member Kalos has been doing uh, a very good job in doing what he should be doing as a council member, which is a building uh, community members, coalitions around this issue, gaining support, um, advocating not just among the community, but also among his council colleagues, who ultimately will have the final vote on this project, which should come to a vote sometime later this fall. Um, and so I think specifically, uh, we are in a very good position in terms of who is representing us on this issue and the work that he has been doing to stop this project. I would say more broadly, we need to have a very um, extensive conversation about how, as Chris said, so much development in the city is developer-driven rather than community-driven, and talk about ways in which we can be proactive, talking about responsible ways to develop our community that don't rely on a developer coming to the community after they've spent years buying a property and accumulating air rights uh, with a project that the community then has very little time to learn about and comment on. So specifically, I think Councilmember Kalos is doing a very good job on this and more broadly, we need to have more community-driven uh, development rather than developer-driven land use. Well, I completely 100% opposed to the blood center, and the question was how do we fix it? This is, in essence, spot zoning, which is completely and patently illegal. 
Uh, and so the problem we have here is we have a broken ULERP system. We have a land use system that is antiquated, that is broken. As a former seven-year community board chair, I have seen this time and time again where projects go through the ULERP system. Sometimes a give back is a park, sometimes it's a school, sometimes a project is defeated, although not that often, and that is the problem. There is not sufficient community input. We have to reform the ULERP and we need to do it legislatively at the council to prevent these kinds of spot zonings from happening. This is, by the way, similar to what happened on East 58th Street, where the East River 50 Alliance, uh, which has endorsed me in this race, fought against a tower and lost, and then they had to initiate their own rezoning of the area to keep that area contextual. Community groups shouldn't have to do that. The onus should not be on them. City Council has to reform the work legislatively once and for all. Thanks, Julie, for having me. How do we stop this project like we've already been doing? We organize as a community, we come together, we speak about why this is bad, why it sets a bad precedent for mid-block rezoning, the impact it will have on the educational complex, specifically the District 75 school for students with disabilities there, the impact on St. Catharines Park. And for me, I'm an organizer by nature. I've led land use campaigns for the last 10 years on behalf of unionized workers in a variety of industries. So I know this process inside and out, and the solution to it is organizing the council colleagues for why this is bad, and then also completely changing ULERP. Right now, the community is the first stop, and it's a non-binding stop. Our input, we are blue in the face, opposing the blood center, myself included, on the record, voting against it tonight as a community board aid member, but we're advisory. The city doesn't need to listen to us. So we're lucky to have support from Councilmember Kalos, from Manhattan Borough President Brewer, Congresswoman Karen Maloney, Senator Kruger, Assemblymember Seawright. But if we didn't have that, we would be in a much different position. So we need to continue organizing together because when we fight together, we win together. And last part on this one, Billy. Well, before I begin my answer, I first want to acknowledge Mark with my but I didn't mention my opening, but it's also on the community board with us and from whom I've learned a lot on issues like these. Here's uh, how we stop this project. What do the following four entities have in common? Community Blood Center of Greater Kansas City, Rhode Island Blood Center, Blood Bank, Blood Bank of Delmarva, and the Innovative Blood Resources of Minnesota and Nebraska. All blood centers acquired by New York Blood Center without a single one needing a rezoning. Why? Because they have an endowment. They're coming to us for a rezoning because they think they can print money out of thin air to get a form of corporate welfare from the city. I think that's wrong, and that's how we stop this. We make sure every council member throughout New York City's five boroughs knows that if this happens here, it's coming to your district and your borough next. We organize, as others have said, and we make plain that member deference, which is something that Julie and Marco and I think have some agreement on, you know, maybe needs to be mended and not ended, but we can't get rid of it because otherwise we're not going to be able, in my opinion, to fundamentally stop this project. So it's about organizing, it's about preserving member deference, and making clear that this is corporate law. Thanks, Bill. Low warn me, we're going to be saying the word, the, the, the phrase, you learn a lot of Right? Can spell it out? <laughs> it, has, it, it has become reality. All right, next question, same topic, you know, talking about land use and overdevelopment and zoning in the neighborhood. Uh, new buildings along the avenues east of Lexington Avenue have no prescribed height limits, although the avenues from Lexington to 5th do. Should the zoning resolution for those avenue districts have a firm height limit, and if so, what should it be and why? Let's start with Bill. So I think the limit should be 210. It should be in the zoning resolution. This gets at something more fundamental, uh, something I think makes me unique on this stage. I believe I'm the only candidate proposing a fundamental rewrite of the 61 zoning resolution. The 61 resolution replaced the 1916 resolution. So that was 45 years. Well, now it's more than 60 years. I think it's time for us to have a zoning resolution that reflects the needs of New York City today. The current resolution has been moved to thousands of pages. It's been mastered by developers and lobbyists. I'm not taking any real estate developer money or lobbyist money because we have to take, uh, we have to make sure we have community-driven zoning, and that starts with a community-driven rewrite of the zoning resolution that should reflect our needs and then give us the leverage we need to get schools, infrastructure, and real affordable housing in our neighborhoods, not any more luxury super Thanks, Bill. Rebecca. On my hat, Community Board 8, I'm proud to have fought in support of the 210-foot height cap. I launched my campaign naming specifically the need for a 210-foot height cap. Before the second avenue subway opened, many developers wouldn't want to play in our neck of the woods, so to speak. They wouldn't come to the easternmost avenues to build. And now we're seeing ourselves inundated with large-scale development, tearing down walk-up apartment buildings like I live in, where our rent control can stabilize more affordable units 
are in the neighborhood for large-scale development that's over 210 feet, takes our light, takes our air, and also produces unaffordable market luxury housing. So we need a 210-foot height cap, and outside of that, we also need to be very targeted in the development we're doing at 210 or below to be sure that we're seeing much more affordable housing being built because it's a false choice when people say we have to up zone to get more affordable housing. That's believing that all new large-scale development has affordable housing. And from my decade of experience running land use campaigns and housing campaigns, that is factually not true. It does not include the affordable housing numbers that we need to meet the needs here in CB5 and throughout the entire city of New York. So we need a 210 foot high cap. We need to be very targeted in development in general. Julie? I also agree that we should have a 210 high cap. Um, and I think we need to reform Mueller once and for all. I've been speaking about this for almost 15 years. The problem we have right now is New York leads to unpredictable results. Every single time you see a completely different negotiation and quite frankly a totally different result. And we need to have a comprehensive master plan once and for all for the city. We are one of the few major cities across the country that actually doesn't do comprehensive planning. We do it piecemeal. It's totally illogical. When you talk to people from other cities and you explain the land use the process here, they scratch their head. It makes no sense and yet we keep allowing it to happen. We need a city council that is going to step up and once and for all demand to reform to Europe and demand a comprehensive master plan, which will deal with everything from light and shadow, but also building more parks, building more affordable housing, which is an urgent need for the community, and building more schools and so many of the other critical needs that we need throughout the Upper East Side, which is a densest neighborhood in the city of New York. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I actually agree with what Julie just said on the issue of a piecemeal zoning and land use. I think that is one of the biggest problems that we have, and I agree that we need a much more comprehensive plan. I would like for that plan to be uh, community-driven. I've been very inspired by the folks in Morningside Heights who have come together with elected officials and members of the community and put together a plan that looks at all of the aspects of their community, so protecting rent regulated housing, figure out, figuring out where there are places um, where upzoning can happen, but also figuring out places where we want stricter height limits um, for various reasons related to that particular part of the community. So that is the type of program that I would like to see us perform here uh, in Yorkville and the Upper East Side. So to the question of whether or not we need specific height limits, I do think there are places where that is necessary. Do I think that it is necessary all along the avenue? I'll be honest, I'm not sure. I believe that we need to come together as a community to look at all of our streets, all of our avenues, all of our side streets, all of our mid-block, and really figure out how we can be proactive in land use and development so that we are protecting affordable housing and cutting back on developer-driven uh, zoning in our city. Okay, that sounds nutrition. Yeah, so I am very supportive of the 210 height cap. I was proud, again, on our community board eight to vote in favor for this. I believe I carry also with me the history of the 210 height cap. I know that we chose that number not out of thin air, but because we that's, that is what it is on Madison, that's what it is on Park, on Fifth, and this is being consistent. I also uh, am I'm supporting the 210 high cap because I know that it's not just about the height of our buildings, it's about our light, our air, our environmental resiliency, which we hear every single time we're talking about this topic, about how uh, how these high buildings are taking away from, all, from our overall resiliency plan. So yes, I am in favor of it, and I will continue to be in favor. And from Trish, we go to me, Chris Sosa. Sorry, I got to forget that. I, I, had a, I had a minor lull. I was thinking about it's okay. You are again. You got a busy <laughs> job. Uh, first, I think something that, that should be really reassuring to everybody watching us is how much confidence you're seeing on this issue across the table. And uh, like those who have spoken before, I do support the 210 height cap. Uh, I really like Billy's extremely intelligent proposal. Uh, about the resolution that we need that we need to work on because this is as julie was pointing out the, the way that we're approaching land use in this city is so incredibly piecemeal it's um it's a free-for-all it's absurd nobody wins and as rebecca was just stating uh sometimes we're presented with this false choice as if we don't build these super tall buildings we're not going to have enough affordable housing but the truth of the matter is when we start building these super tall buildings it ends up being filled with luxury condos so we're not actually getting more affordable housing do that. So what we need to we need to separate that kind of uh, overly ideological fight that's happening around that one issue because it's based on a false premise. So I really appreciate her pointing that out. And Marco Pano? Uh, thank you. This is another reason why I'm running for the city council position. I have the op uh, an opportunity to establish our limits on the unprotected avenues. This provides an opportunity to build affordable housing 
and to protect the small business and especially the pop and mom stores of our district. Yes, I am supporting the, uh, the position of the community board in 210 feet high, maximum on the unprotected avenues. Uh, the only thing I'm going to add is I think it's wrong to start thinking to change the zoning resolution. I probably feel he never even saw what color in that movie. Thank you. March. Okay. Uh, we're going to make one little quick jump. We're going to, we're going to jump to five as we talked about a lot. We'll save that to the end. So we're going to go to the next question, guys. By the way, you learned uniform land use review process. For you folks at home, uniform land use review process. You learned. You'll be dreaming about you learned. I know. Let's go to six. Um, and this is something, as a, as a parent of a kid, one of the few really cool open spaces is, is the field at Marks Brothers Park. And uh, uh, the de Blasio administration has declared that Marks Brothers Park, known as jointly owned playground, JOP, there's another one, located between 96th and 97th Street and 1st and 2nd Avenue, is not protected parkland for purposes of ULERP and state alienation legislation review. So by implication, none of the other jobs in the district, or the 268 other jobs in the city, are protected with the result that the city could develop them or use the airways at any time, right? So should MVP and other jobs be deemed parkland in the zoning resolution? And if so, would you support or sponsor legislation in the city council to achieve this end? So let's start with Mark. Thank you for the question. Absolutely. It's a big one, sorry. Yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> this problem is similar to the plot center proposal on the, on the park. Created perpetual shops. We need to establish a policy that the air rights from any open space must not be transferable. In full disclosure, I am a soccer player for many years on the park that you are mentioning. And the creation of shadows from the surrounding buildings during those snow days don't allow the snow to melt, and we are unable to play. Now, if this proposed out of scale building, we won't be able to use the park anymore during the winter time. Therefore, I am very happy to sponsor this legislation. Thank you. Chris? Yes. Uh, I think first we need to say thank you to the uh, Carnegie Hill neighbors here because they've uh, been one of four groups that have already been advocating strongly on this issue of the council in 2017 has actually begun the process of um, endorsing the position to end this, this alienation. Uh, but the short answer to your question is yes and yes. Uh, we need to protect our spaces, we need to protect our parks, and uh, the Blasio administration has proven itself incompetent over and over again. That's no surprise to anyone. Yeah, so um, the short answer is, of course, yes and yes. I echo Chris, and I'm glad you mentioned it um, in talking about making Carnegie Hill neighbors, friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, and our other partner organizations that have been handling this fight head on. I and the chair of the co-chair of the Parks and Waterfront Committee for Community Board 8. When you talk parks and open space, you're talking my love language. So uh, it, it could not get more personal for me as a mother to a two-year-old. This is our, we need our park space, we need our open space. We know that when we talk about parks and open space, when we talk about the Esplanade, when we talk about Marx Brothers, when we talk about Rupert, we are talking not just about pretty park space, we are talking about a key piece to our overall resiliency and sustainability. We are talking about pulling down our neighborhoods, which is especially important in a community that has over 25% seniors. Uh, we really do need every single inch of our open space, and I am going to do every single thing I can to preserve and protect every inch that we have of it. Uh, this is not something that is a, a policy for me. This is a part of my heart and my advocacy, and really where, where I would be putting my focus. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, Kim? Yeah, so uh, my answer to this question is absolutely yes. Um, I actually have a, a good friend, Noah Diamond, who's very involved in the Marx Brothers uh, Appreciation Society here in New York, which is actually a thing, and so he's actually talked to me uh, about this issue because this is something that is very important to them, given the historical significance uh, of that playground. Um, we need to do everything we can to protect uh, as much open space here on the Upper East Side as we can. Um, we know that it is uh, very limited. Um, I was on a, a community board, actually a Parks Department meeting uh, the other day that Patricia was on as well, talking about the renovations for Rupert Park. And, and when you look at the map, you realize that to get anywhere else to another open space or park, you're talking about a 10-minute walk, a 15-minute walk. 
for many people in this city, their parks are their backyard. It's the only opportunity that they have to let their kids go outside and play, um, to, to be able to breathe the fresh air. So we need to do everything we can to protect it. I would also say, given the renovations happening at Rupert, the notion that we would you know, allow any kind of threats to any other open space in the city when that bag would be shut down for a part of the time um, would be catastrophic. So we need to do everything we can to protect it. Julie? Yes, I totally agree with what has been said. And the problem is, is that the new space that the city would provide is legally not protected. That is a fundamental legal issue. This is a very dangerous precedent for all the JOPs and 268 that exist across the city of New York. Actually, if all 268 JOPs were developed with those air rights, it would account for between 20 and 40 million square feet of developable uh, space. So we cannot allow this to happen. So this has set a, a really dangerous precedent for open space. We on the Upper East Side are the densest district in the city of New York. We have one of the lowest amounts of open space. So we have to protect every single amount of open space that we have. And I really, uh, the groups that sponsored us, um, the Friends and Carnegie Hill Neighbors and Municipal Arts Society, which I used to serve on their board, fought this and did such a good job fighting it. But now we have a really bad legal precedent and we're gonna need to fight very hard at the council level to increase protections to JOPs to make sure this isn't an issue. Rebecca? Yes and yes. We have to protect our park space. We have so little of it here on the Upper East Side and throughout the entire fifth council district. So we need to legislatively fix this. We need to make sure that our parks remain fully public. And this question also makes me think back to the debate a few years back about building on Rupert Park because the park had aged out of it being public parkland, if anyone recalls. I was at City Hall that day for a hearing with a bunch of union members, and I was like, wait, hold on, everyone. This is my community. I live there. And so if we're not going to be legislatively fixing this, it happened at Marx Brothers. It was debated at Rupert Park. It can happen anywhere in the city, and we absolutely have to protect them. I will also add that the development happening by Avalon Bay up at 96th Street between 96th and 97th is also very irresponsible. Um, Avalon Bay is known to be a very agreed developer to workers to communities they've exploited a number of communities throughout New York City there are a number of active campaigns within the labor movement against them and so seeing our community come together to also oppose this on the park front is also just wonderful for me it's quite an intersectional moment. So my answer is yes these are absolutely parks that should be deemed as such uh, just think about this if you look throughout Manhattan uh, according to the Furman Center about 90 in most community districts 99% of residents live within a quarter mile of a park. In our community district, about two thirds, 66%, live within a quarter mile of a park. We have some of the least open space in the entire city. We have to do better. So it starts with saying that Marx Brothers is absolutely a park. It's one and a half acres. I was looking at the Parks Department website the other day. Plenty of one and a half acre parks uh, listed on the website across all five boroughs. But secondly, we need more parks uh, throughout our community district. Uh, I'm a tennis player, but I'll just tell you, Queensboro, Oval, it shouldn't be a tennis ball. It should be a park. Uh, we need to make sure that the Rupert Park renovation goes forward. We need more dog runs in our neighborhood. I, I mean, think about the rising dog owners during the course of the pandemic. So we have to support our parks. We have to support our open space. It is key to making this a livable, thriving city. And I'm going to fight for our parks every day when I'm going to the city council. Thanks, Bill. And despite coaching a winless season in York Flag football this year, I do love that place. I have horrible memories, but it's still great. Thanks, yeah. Marks, We're going to switch. Okay, welcome back. Wait, did we go in here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, next question, guys. Uh, and then we'll start with, uh, with Bill again and go, go back around. Your position on planning together, I think Julie uh, touched on the comprehensive planning for the city. Uh, planning together, the comprehensive planning proposal initiated by uh, Corey Johnson, a, a council speaker. Uh, are you a fan? Uh, and if so, is, it, is this the right plan? So while I agree with Julie that we need a comprehensive plan, I disagree with this specific plan. We all may on this uh, stage. Uh, you know, first, uh, Speaker Johnson's plan does not have adequate community input. It requires three uh, alternatives, three land use plans, but it doesn't necessarily require that one of them be a community driven plan. So I think we need community driven planning alongside perhaps the 197A model. And what does that look like? It looks like actually resourcing community boards with urban planners and other experts to develop those plans. So that's number one. But what, what else do we need? What do I think the plan gets right that should be incorporated in a comprehensive plan? We have to align the city budget with the 10-year capital strategy. We have to align the statement of district needs that come from community boards like the one I serve on. 
uh, with the, the city's uh, long-term planning. Uh, right now, you do not have an organized plan like most cities, uh, or many cities rather, around the country. And if we did have an organized plan that is community-driven, I believe that we would get the real affordable housing we need, the schools uh, capacity that we need, helping our parks like we just discussed, and building the infrastructure that we need to be a 21st century city. We absolutely need comprehensive planning in the city, but I don't believe that Speaker Johnson's proposal is the solution to it. It doesn't go far enough on community input. We have to be binding. We must be the first stop and the last stop for input on anything. It doesn't do anything, honestly, on workforce requirements. I'm a proud union member, as I said, and housing development, development in general, can help put people back to work coming out of COVID. So it's unfortunate to me to not see the workforce that brings about this development taken into account in it at all. It lacks information on things like community land trusts and what we do with our public land, for example, on how we ensure we have racial impact studies when we rezone and develop in communities that are mostly black and brown or low income, because so often the development we see there doesn't meet the needs. And when I think about those issues, I think about the Jerome Avenue rezoning campaign I worked on, the Inwood rezoning campaign I worked on, the Bedford Union Armory campaign that I coordinated, where I see how our lack of comprehensive planning harms communities and harms workers all around the city. And that's why I know this plan from Speaker Johnson is not the solution. And we need to be having more conversations and have the next council in 2022 address this issue. Julie? Well, as I said previously, I 100% support comprehensive planning. Uh, the Speaker Johnson's bill, however, does not, as been said before, give enough community board input. I'm a community board person. I chair community board for seven years. I was one of the longest serving Manhattan community board chairs in the city. And I do think that that really matters. A community boards matter, and you need to have local input. And my concern with this bill is that it doesn't really um, get a lot of community input. If this bill passes, and its future is uncertain right now as to whether it will pass, if it passes, it needs to be amended to then involve community input. So what does comprehensive planning look like? It starts with a master plan. It starts with a master plan for the city of New York. It then goes to a borough plan. So each borough has their own master plan. And it's driven by communities. So communities really have a say in terms of height, in terms of transportation infrastructure, in terms of park, hospitals, and healthcare. All of these issues need to be addressed through comprehensive planning. Okay. So I need to sound like a broken record, but uh, I, I think I agree with much of what has been said. Um, I, I fully support comprehensive planning. The piecemeal way that we do land use and zoning right now um, is ridiculous and allows developers to have far too much power in the system. Um, but I agree. You know, I, I talked earlier about the Morningside Heights Coalition and the work that they did together, uh, coming up with a, a way to zone their neighborhood that made sense for them, uh, that helped protect, protect red regulated tenants. Um, and, and really was community driven and, and, and brought in all stakeholders. So I, I do believe that any comprehensive plan is going to need far more community input than this current plan puts forward. And the last thing I would say is that I think that input has to go even beyond community boards. You know, right now, um, it's, it's a relatively few number of people in the community who can actually attend many of these meetings. Many have childcare commitments. Um, many have jobs where they're working strange hours. So I would like to see more of an effort made by the city to bring more voices to the table, reaching out specifically to folks who live in NYCHA, for example, folks who are parents providing childcare to make sure that we are getting the voices of everybody when we're making these decisions. Sure. Yeah, so uh, similarly to everybody, how everybody else has said this, I do also believe that we should have comprehensive planning. I am not supportive of Corey Johnson's bill uh, for a number of reasons, as I'm not going to try to repeat what uh, everybody else has said, but I'm just going to point out a couple of other uh, nuances here. Uh, one is, is the target goals. Uh, these are right now not clear whether or not they're prescriptive or, or what they expect to see, and there is no community participation in that process. There's no real way to appeal early on for community boards or for any member of the community, so we are much later in the process, which is problematic. Finally, when it comes to what does this actually mean for us if we did have a comprehensive plan through the process that Corey Johnson proposed, and the truth is, is that it would be making it easier for developers to get through projects through the EIS point, uh, through the EIS process. If they are able to prove that it's consistent with the plan, then they are able to streamline and move factor through it. That is not what we want to see here. We want to see power put in the hands of people. We want to see power put in the hands of communities. We want to make sure that we're taking away power from developers and putting it back into our neighborhood. So that's really where my concern is. Chris? My friends on the table would be incredibly diplomatic. This is a terrible plan, and we all <laughs> oppose it. Um, and as Julie was just saying, if it's passed, we would just have to amend it later. And I'm not a fan of passing bills that are bad, that we then just have to you know, 
essentially scrap and restart for amendments. And I, I think that my, and so to avoid repeating what everybody else has just said, my primary concern is about democracy. Uh, when you have de Blasio saying this just creates more unnecessary bureaucracy, you know it just creates more unnecessary bureaucracy. And we're dealing with a situation where we're going to be putting even more power in the hands of people who are appointed, not elected. And I believe that when we're dealing with these kinds of these planning issues, we need community input and we need our elected officials to have more power, not unaccountable bureaucrats. Mark, we'll follow up on this one. Uh, thank you for the question. This is why I am running for this position, because I have knowledge and expertise as a planner and as a council member. My participation will be important to me on this plan, as well as I strongly encourage our community participation in the plan. The crisis that we have is for two reasons. The city has been working with different plans that sometimes contradict each other. Second, the city council has been working with a deference policy. They give, this is your neighborhood, and that is my neighborhood and that is wrong. Therefore, we have overdevelopment in our community. And in the other communities, this investment, forming a disparity city that we cannot tolerate anything more. Thank you. OK, let's go to the next question. And uh, Marco, we'll start with you this one. And again, honestly, this is a huge issue in this neighborhood, landmark preservation, economic development, big issues in Upper East Side. How do you approach the community board review process? And, we have a lot of folks who are very familiar with that process. Where do you think the issues of social equity and upzoning interplay in certain districts? And finally, here we go again. Please describe your opinion on the Mueller process and its current iteration. And Marco's yes. John, thank you. Thank you. Another reason why I'm running is because I know the Upper East Side history, which it has, which was created for affluent people, and this in clay has to be maintained and preserved its prestige and its status because this is part of our cultural, architectural, and history of our city. Even though that the Euro process has some rationality, the final determination is in the hands of the mayor because he appoints the director of city planning, the commissioners of city planning, and if the city council disapproves it, the mayor has the power to veto uh, the city council's decision. Then the city council has another opportunity to challenge the mayor's decision. They have to have 75% of the council members in opposition to veto the mayor's approval. Then the city wins. Another problem. Time. Let me finish. Another <laughs> conflict is the conflict of interest. Just a couple more seconds. The, the applicants hire the environmental company to prepare his environmental report. As a council person, I will correct it. Thank you. Okay, thank perfect. you so much. You got it. Christopher. Can we do let me finish now and then just go? Oh, oh, we can implement that across the entire table. Uh, so, oh, man. Uh, so this is a really good question. Um, and it's interesting because it comes back to something that Rebecca first brought up earlier in the conversation, which is the, the tension that can exist between upzoning and social equity. And as we discussed earlier, um, when we're talking about things like height caps in the specific setting, um, that isn't necessarily where the social equity problem is coming in. The problem is that the buildings aren't tall enough. The problem is that the buildings don't have enough affordable housing in them, and then we're creating building new buildings. We're not ensuring there's affordable public housing in those buildings. So it's a, it's a compounding problem that's not going to be solved by making anything taller. In addition to that, the EULA process itself, oh my gosh, um, I have like a page of notes here, so I'm not just going to read them all <laughs> because it would take a really long time. But, um, then you would have to say, wait, let me then, Yeah, let me finish. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we need to pass intro 1572. We need to ensure that we're taking uh, real racial uh, impact study time. into consideration. And you don't have to let me finish. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I really appreciate this question because at the end of the day, it's talking about who has the final, who has the final say about the future of your, of our community. 
And truly, again, I believe that that power, that say, belongs in the hands of our neighbors. That does not belong in the, hand, in the hands of real estate developers. That does not belong in the hands of luxury developers who would have you believe, as Chris and Rebecca already have said, you believe in this false dichotomy that the only way that you get a fraction of affordability is when you go high dense. That is wrong, and I reject that dichotomy. I do believe that the one thing that we have, the one process that allows our community to have a say in the, our future, in our neighborhood, is Euler, period. And we need to do everything we can to strengthen and expand that. We need to increase the ability for our communities to have a say in this. We need to increase what goes under the scope of an EIS so that we accurately measure the metrics of what a development has on, in our community. We need to do everything we can to involve as many people as possible because I believe that when our neighbors have a say and have a seat at the table, that's where we avoid it. That's where we avoid inappropriate development. Thanks, Trisha Kim. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, I want to begin by referencing something that Marco said, and I may have misunderstood, but I think it's important to understand that as important as it is to preserve our history and make sure that we are preserving our landmarks and, and, and much of our historical buildings here, uh, not just on the Upper East Side, but in New York City, we also want to be careful that we're not inadvertently um, reinforcing much of the segregation that we have seen in this city uh, over many years. So I think we always need to make sure that we are striking that balance between preserving our history, but also making it known that we want people in our neighborhoods, we want new people in our neighborhoods, and we want our neighborhoods to be desegregated because that is how we create a truly vibrant city. In terms of EULA, um, in addition to environmental impact studies, which are very important, I would like to, to see racial impact studies, and I know that is something that is working its way through the council right now. Um, you know, understanding uh, that we take things, for example, like whether or not a building is in a floodplain into consideration when we're talking about land use or zoning. Making yeah. sure that we're truly zoning for equity so that everybody in this city has the opportunity to, to, to live in this city and, and to make a life for themselves. Julie? Well, I think the root question really gets to the social equity of zoning tension that exists in the city, and to me, it is a false choice because we need to build more affordable housing. How do we do it? We need to focus on area median income, AMI. Right now, AMI is we don't have a city-based area median income. We have a regional one, which means that Putnam County, Rockland County, Westchester County, all come into the equation in terms of what constitutes affordable housing. We have to change this AMI calculation because that is perhaps one of the best ways that we will finally, once and for all, be able to build more affordable housing in New York City. Clearly, Manhattan and the Upper East Side has become unaffordable for so many New Yorkers. And so we've got to dig deep and think about how do we change it. And to me, AMI is probably one of the top things we really have to zero in on to make a seismic change in that. Rebecca. I'll start with Euler. So Euler needs to be completely overhauled and completely changed because Community-based input is not binding. We need to be binding input. We need to be an actual check on the system, not simply people turning out to community board meetings, opposing something or supporting something to then have city government and other elected officials move in a different direction. So we need to start with making community input binding. Outside of that, we need to change the environmental impact statement and review process because it leaves out so many issues. We can't just look at the physical space we're going to be developing on. We need to look at the impact the development will have on local schools, on the workforce, on the local health, the local economy, what the jobs will be like coming from it. And all of that's ignored in the Euler process. And when it comes to historic preservation, I think of one of my favorite streets in the neighborhood, Anderson Place, right off 86th Street. So I'm a preservationist. I don't want to see more last superstructures. I love the small character, the small walk-ups in our neighborhood. So I am a preservationist, as I said, and I want to be sure we maintain that character in our community. We have some lovely buildings here that I don't want to see torn down. Um, but I do agree with him that what's concerning to hear about upholding the Upper East Side is an enclave for wealthier New Yorkers. I want my community to be home to everyone, no matter the money you make, the color of your skin, your, your background, anything. Nope. So I'll start just picking up on that point, maybe I didn't miss here, but the idea that we need to preserve our community as a community for affluent people, and forgive me if I didn't miss here, I think is, is wrong. We need socioeconomic diversity, it's what makes our city great, and we need it here in our district. I also think it misrepresents a little bit about what this district is, think about the working class history of Workville. Think about what was an island built in the image of FDR, underpinned by true middle class housing, Mitchell Long housing. Um, so I, I did want to make that comment. I also want to push back somewhat on what Julie said. You know, I was talking to one of our foremost zoning language leaders in our district who 
if we can be that focusing on AMIs a bit misplaced. We can always go to a development project and set the percentage of AMI. So while I do think it could be tweaked, the real issue is at what percentage are we building affordable housing? I think we need to be having affordable housing set aside for people leaving up uh, the home shelter system or seniors trying to age in place. And also for people making $40,000, $50,000, $60,000 a year. Last, year, last thing, uniform land use review procedure. We need to focus on, as others have said, racial impact studies, mental health impact studies that add in, and making sure that true affordability, as I've just Thanks. discussed, is input in that process. Thanks, Bill. And we'll start with you on the question. And this is like a long, you guys saw this as a very long question. So I'm going to say it's question nine. But really, it's what is your view on the recent citywide zoning text amendment to use floor area bonuses and height increases to make improvements to transit stations, especially for elevators, to increase accessibility? And why don't we just go into the question, Bill, because I, I think you guys are, are familiar with it. But that's the, the main issue we're talking about here. Yeah, it's called zoning for accessibility. Yeah. And I first want to acknowledge our colleague Rebecca Moore who's done such a tremendous job leading on issues of accessibility, disability justice in our city. As I'm sure she'll tell you in a few minutes, 25% of our subway stations are quote unquote accessible. That's shameful. And we're not even necessarily talking about full accessibility. We're not just talking about elevators needing to work. We need to talk about audible uh, sound. We need to talk about rail in our subway systems and more. So we have an accessibility crisis in the city. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm a bit torn about this because I think this is yet another attempt to ask private developers to give us the benefit, if they would deign to do so, of doing what government fundamentally should be doing. It is the role of government, it's the role of the MTA, the state and the city, to make sure all of our subway stations are accessible. It is a crying shame that they have failed to do this. It is a crying shame that the MTA capital budget contemplates $5 billion for accessibility improvements. It is not nearly enough. So my preference would be for the government to actually do its job, make sure our subway stations have elevators that work, escalators that work, are accessible for all New Yorkers. That is the fundamental role of government. So I think zoning for accessibility raises a lot more questions than answers right now. Okay, Rebecca. I'm a disabled New Yorker, so this one is very personal to me. I was pushed on the subway in 2013, and that's why I have a lifelong disability. And then for over a year, I couldn't ride the train because the system is so inaccessible. As Billy said, my number one data point, less than 25% of the New York City public transit system is accessible right now. And as I said at the community board, and Billy echoed, it's not just accessibility with es es uh, elevators, excuse me, it's escalators, it's audible announcements, it's braille, it's textured surfaces for wheelchair users, it's ramps, it's all of the above, soup to nuts. I would like to see the government fund billions of dollars of work to do this, coupling it with workforce requirements to put New Yorkers to work coming out of COVID. However, as a disabled New Yorker, I'm here to tell you plans like that have been put forth, and the MTA always raised that budget for something else to be done, and it's far too long that we have not seen accessibility updates done in the community. And actually last week when we heard this uh, proposal at the community board, a wheelchair user in our neighborhood turned out to say, why would anyone oppose this? We cannot get accessibility and it's high time that we have it. So I am supportive of this plan, but I think we need to do even more than this. We can start with this, but there are very real issues with having private developers be responsible for these elevators. It's not enough time for me to speak about it now, but I will be more so at the community board meeting when we review this policy again. Julie? Yeah, so my um, father is disabled. He's in a wheelchair, and as a mother who has a three year old and uses a stroller, I really uh, believe that we have a major accessibility problem, as Rebecca has so eloquently pointed out. This is an enormous problem, and we have to fix it. This CFA zoning for accessibility is one way to do it. The challenge is because the MTA does not own the actual uh, land where you need to put the elevators, it does require legally an easement. Now, what should the give back be? The, the devil is in the details, okay? Let's be honest. We really need to study this plan. I support CFA, as Rebecca does, but I really want to zero in on what this plan actually does. Um, it's a recent plan. It is, um, the MTA and the Department of City Planning have been going around to community boards throughout the city to present. So this is a time for the public really to weigh in on components of it. But we, once and for all, absolutely, unequivocally, need to make all of our public transportation accessible for all. Thanks, Julie. Kim? Yeah, so I was nodding like that a lot as, as all of my colleagues here were speaking because I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I do support zoning for accessibility, um, but it is indicative of a larger problem, which is that we here in the city are often um, at the, the whims of state government and the MTA, and they often do not invest uh, in 
transportation and accessibility here downstate as much as they should. And so the city is forced into a position where they need to come up with plans to make these improvements and to create accessibility. I do wish that the government would do more in terms of demanding these accessibility changes. The reality is that any developer, any um, building, any company that is near transportation makes that property inevitably more valuable because people want to be near transportation hubs. They want to be near where there are subways. And so they are getting a benefit by being able to build near these transportation hubs. And so I don't think it's asking too much for them to contribute to make those transportation stations um, more accessible for everybody. So I do support the plan, but I would like to see us demand more. Time. Use a little more stick and a little less carrot in this plan. Trisha. Yeah, I, I agree a lot with what, what has been said already, but um, I'll just add on a couple things to it. So I, I first and foremost, um, I also want to echo what Billy said about Rebecca. Thank you again for your leadership on um, all things related to creating a more accessible city for all New Yorkers. It's so vitally important. And yes, it's very true. We need to prioritize. City, state, and federal elected officials need to prioritize creating a more accessible city for all New Yorkers, period. I also have reservations, at least with the concept of privatizing or looking to our private developers to help us with, the, with what the government should be doing on its own. At a minimum, I think that we should be including ULERP in this process. I'll say it again. I know it's been the word said most tonight, but ULERP is the one process through which communities, city council members, uh, borough presidents can have an actual say in these, in, in these uh, developments. And so I think it's absolutely essential to have ULERP be a part of it. I think that it is essential that this, this uh, should it move forward that we include all the boroughs it's not just Manhattan where we need accessibility we need accessibility everywhere and then to a nuanced issue that Rebecca pointed out I think that when we talk about accessibility we need to talk about the level we need to talk about full accessibility for all of our stations making sure that everybody has uh, has can uh, use each station yeah thanks Trisha Chris first I just want to personally say thank you to Rebecca for being such a leader on this issue um, she's share her story with us all in such an authentic way and she's changed the nature of the race around disability so i very appreciate you um, this is one of those sticky issues where my ideology and the reality on the ground are somewhat in conflict because i know that uh, new yorkers need this accessibility now um, and i know it's the government's responsibility but they're not going to do it so we're in a situation where we have to ask what is the what is the best option we have available to, to us? Um, like Trisha said, I think involving you is, is helpful, and more than likely we're going to have to move forward with this plan because um, it doesn't seem that there's any other solution at the moment for disabled New Yorkers. Barbara? Uh, thank you for the question. But nobody answered the question that posed to us. Uh, the, the question is right here is to discuss the proposal zoning for accessibility. Uh, in this case, your process is too long and too expensive for a developer and can't delay its development. And this is why the special permit process was created. The proposed maximum floor area ratio is four, two floors high is too generous and too obscure. This is the beautiful place for look for because some developers can get more benefits than the others. It will depend how connected is the developer and how experienced the developer's team is. That is why it's a wrong policy. The relation should be one to three. For every square feet provided by the developer, regardless the type of the entrance, the developer would receive three square feet. Thank you. Okay, let's bounce back uh, to the question five because we, we talked a lot about it, but I think we, uh, position on the 210 foot height limit for buildings on the Upper East Side, Marcos, so we'll kick back into that. Oh, I, uh, what was the question? Uh, your position on the 210 foot height limit for uh, Upper East Side. Buildings. I strongly support. I think this is the great benefit to allow to negotiate affordable housing to maintain and preserve a uh, uh, small business, uh, a small business, especially popular market stores sometimes even to protect some uh, historical districts in some areas. And that's allowed basically to control the developer, not to attack the developer. The developer is not the bad guy. Right here, the bad guy is the city, the, the, the decision makers, because they don't know what are they doing. And they're coming to the city council to make decisions that they have no experience. 
and they blame to the decision makers when in reality it's them the problem with the with the problem that they have the deference problems. Thank you. First, uh, the answer is still yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, sure. Yeah, strongly support to Kent Pike. Yeah. Yeah, I've said this before. I, I have a hard time committing to a, a specific company. I think about buildings in the neighborhood that I love, or for, uh, towers, for example, Yorkville, um, Knickerbocker, all, all of which are, are far taller. Um, we do need more housing in the city. I don't believe that we need um, super tall luxury buildings. Uh, and, and I'm always open to, to new information, but I feel like committing to and across the board height cap on every single building could have unintended consequences. And so I we need to learn a little bit more about it, but as of right now, I, I can't commit to that number. Sure. I guess I support it, and I think we need to find additional ways to build more affordable housing. Okay. I support the 210 foot height cap, and I just want to take my remaining time to thank everyone up here for their comments around accessibility. I'm honored to have elevated this issue, um, and for example, hopefully in the future, an event like this could be fully accessible, um, because right now, even if not, there was a flight of stairs to get to the elevator. Um, there are no captions on the video right now. There's no ASL here, so we need to be having these conversations around accessibility, and I'm really happy to be advancing that agenda through this campaign. Okay. Billy, last thought, last part of this one. Yeah, I, I support that, I, and, and here's the thing, we can't be negotiating against ourselves. The next council member is going to have to go in uh, and be very firm with the city planning uh, commission, very firm with the next mayor and our other council members about what it is that we need on the Upper East Side. Um, you know, Kim's right, we don't want ultra luxury buildings, but right now, so many of these lots are, as of right, I think about 86 and first, I think that's an Excel lot. Um, who knows right now what's happening with that property? But you know, as is, there's the potential to have another super luxury, super tall building on the Upper East Side with no affordable component. Or you could have a building, like we do on some parts of the Upper East Side, that are, say, 30 floors, and there are 30 apartments. There's an apartment per floor. So I think we also have to recognize the false choice between height and density that's sometimes created. That's not a particularly dense building. So I do support the height limit. I think it's how we get some leverage to actually get the real affordability, schools, infrastructure, and other needs that we so desperately need. Thanks, Bill. Bill, we'll uh, kick it off with you for as we head into the, the final topic, home stretch, guys. Small business and economic recovery. And this question is, what is your plan for the wholesale recovery of the Upper East Side? Obviously, these past 14 months, we've all seen these uh, shops that we love close, worried that other ones would close. It, it's, it's, it's been tough. Uh, your plan for recovery on the Upper East Side, small business post-pandemic, plus uh, a little bit of a look at a long-term view regionally. Yeah, so uh, you're right, we've had a vacancy crisis here on the Upper East Side, and it's not just because of COVID. Even before COVID, one of our zip codes, 10021, had the second most retail vacancies in all of New York City. So what are we going to do about that? First, our small business owners, our mom pops, desperately need a hand. They're facing landlords who are often, I think, too greedy, jacking up the rent, kicking them out, keeping the store front vacant for months, if not years. We've all seen that story play out. So they need government, I think, to step in and actually pass legislation that's going to help. So where do we start? I really like Council Member Helen Rosenfeld's bill. This is called Storefront Bill of Rights that would require landlords to give notice, 120 days notice, uh, to tenants uh, about whether they're going to renew their lease. We give tenants a one year uh, right of uh, renewal. We also need to do other things around simplifying business for small businesses. Uh, one thing, citywide permit would help. We need to address the commercial rent tax, which hits Business is south of 96th Street, uh, so I support legislation that would reform or repeal it uh, for businesses that pay annual rents of a million dollars or less. Uh, and I think let's get creative uh, around ideas like having a city seamless. Uh, restaurants are paying huge fees to seamless and Uber Eats and others. The city could get into this business, drive down those fees, and help our neighborhood restaurants. Those are some ideas. I think in the next question I'll have a chance to speak about a few more. Cool. Yes. All right, let's head on to uh, Rebecca on that same question about recovery after the pandemic. Not after, during, after, it's still During, wrong. in the midst? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're still in the pandemic, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Wear your mask if you're not vaccinated. Public service announcement. Don't go. take that out of my time. No, no, no. <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> now it's small businesses. So during COVID, you know, we've lost some of our favorite small businesses in the neighborhood. But long before, we were already seeing the storefront vacancy issue just impaling in our community. And so what we need to do is first support businesses that have been able to hold off, put direct money in their hands, work with small business services to put grants on the table that don't need to be repaid to help businesses stay open while we continue to be in the pandemic and move 
towards reopening. Outside of that, we need to pass commercial rent control. So many of these mom and pops sign a lease in the face of exorbitant rent increases that they can't shoulder, even long before and long after COVID. So we need to do that. We need to pass the Small Business Job Survival Act. Small businesses are one of our biggest employers. Here in the city of New York, think about the restaurant industry, for example, and how many people it employs and supports and all of those families. So we need to be passing that legislation. And outside of that, we need to get creative. We need to be working with Albany to pass penalties for landlords that keep storefronts purposely off the market. We need to change the tax loopholes that allow them to take that vacancy off on their taxes and harm our communities with an empty storefront. Because also think, this relates back to public safety. As Trisha said, when you have vibrant communities with people on the streets, businesses open, that fosters public safety as well. Julie? Uh, we need a three-pronged approach, city, state, and federal. At the city level, we need to lower fines on all small businesses. I did that formerly as Commissioner of Consumer Affairs. Every agency needs to do it. The city should provide back office space to small businesses to help with them on that. We agree we need to focus on public safety to bring tourism back, because tourism accounts for 25% of bar and restaurant sales, and we need to eradicate the commercial rent tax. On the state level, we need to do what we did after 9-11, which is a sales tax holiday. It works, it helps these small businesses, and we should be doing that. And then at the federal level, there is a tremendous amount of funds left in PPP loans. Right now, the city small business services agency is not connecting enough small businesses. I speak every day with small businesses and connect them myself. That's absurd. We need there to be a dedicated team at the federal and city level that is in constant contact to get more of our small businesses the federal aid that is already there but that they're not able to access. Okay. Yeah, so this is an issue that is um, particularly important to me. Um, in 2019, I started a group called Northville by Local um, because I saw the effect that empty storefronts were having on our neighborhoods and I wanted to help promote and protect our local mom and pops. We hosted a small business walking tour of the neighborhood shortly before the pandemic um, to try to, to promote these businesses to our neighbors. Um, in terms of what the city needs to do, I think first and foremost, we need to help our small businesses through this pandemic and that means microloans, it means grants, hopefully coming from some of the federal money that, that we have gotten um, in, in response to the pandemic. Um, but I think Julie is right. I, I talked to small business owners who say that the, the extent of the city's help was to give them a list of banks who were doing PPP loans, and that was it. Um, and many of them didn't end up getting help, but they are now on the email list of all of these banks for various loan offers. So what we need is uh, liaisons who can work directly with these small business owners to figure out which, which loans and which grants are most appropriate for them, and then get them connected. Um, I also support the Small Business Job Survival Act, which would allow local mom and pops to be able to negotiate more fairly with their landlords and hopefully you know, keep them in their establishments so that we don't see all these empty storefronts because of rising rents. Sure. Yeah, so you've heard uh, the, the statistic time and time again, we know that over a third of our small businesses are going to close or have closed because of the pandemic. We know that even as people are starting to venture out and back into the city without masks, uh, that, that our small businesses are still going to suffer long, uh, long after everybody's back, back to relatively normal. Uh, and I wish that I could say that there was one bill, I wish that I could say that with one person in the city council that we could save our small businesses. But the truth is, is that it will take efforts on the city, state, and federal level to keep those who are still able to stay alive, to, to keep them to keep them thriving. So I echo what a lot of the other candidates have said. I believe that we should be passing the Small Business Job Survival Act. I will just add that I did propose a legacy small business program of my own that would freeze uh, the rents of the truly unique small businesses that add so much more than just a tenant to our brick and mortar uh, businesses, uh, storefronts over here. I believe that we need direct funding. Um, I will also say that we need to uh, increase protections for our small businesses against the predatory behavior of uh, landlords who are harassing tenants, who are uh, harassing our small businesses, trying to kick them out just to keep a vacant storefront of, uh, out there and to uh, sell, sell their building or, or to find someone who is willing to pay a higher rent. This is something that we need to do to further protect those who are most vulnerable, and those are our small businesses. Chris, from the Small Business Job Survival Act, Banksy I agree with almost everything that's been said here, and I especially want to thank Tricia and Kim for their personal efforts on behalf of small businesses over the past years. And I really want to focus on uh, what Julie brought up, which is the importance of connecting small businesses to federal funds. Um, the truth of the matter is there's a lot that the city council simply can't do because there's a finite budget. And uh, on our own, we're not going to save small businesses. And we have a, a, broken, a broken system 
through which we're, we're not really connecting a lot of these businesses to the resources that they need to supply. So we need to ensure that we are getting those resources to them immediately because every day matters in the life of a small business and we're seeing increasing vacancies. And as Rich was just talking about, um, we, we need to crack down on predatory landlords who are forcing small businesses out uh, for financial gain. Uh, we're going to lose the general character of this neighborhood and the reason why a lot of people live here is because of this local life. So our, our we need to be laser focused on ensuring that small businesses survive and new small businesses are able to open. Hi. Marco, last word on you. Oh, thank you. My uh, plan should be first to vaccinate all the population. With the federal government economic relief, we need to put the money in the right hands. Delay fines fees for the small business. We need to have an assessment of the business conditions and their needs. We need to lower the crime rate in the subway and parks and to reduce attacks against anti-Semitism and Asian attacks and street crimes and evaluate every three months the outdoor dining structure. Thank you. Okay. I think a lot of it, almost everybody touched on the retail crisis. I mean, you feel like you did that and you should we talk more about it? Or? You should do a lightning round when you ask us on favorite business. <laughs> Again? <laughs> oh, uh, Video blue, all the mind. Video blue, missing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a couple. I was worried about O'Flanagan's by me, and then we opened. Because was, was, they have um, they have popcorn shrimp, and it's like ridiculous. I love it. I know it's, not, it's a horrible thing, but this is what I mean, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, These are the little things that make you love all well, yeah, rappers. Yeah. A neighborhood institution for how many years in that yeah. 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 Well, you know what? Since since we're kind of talking about that, I mean, let's do a kind of a, a you know a wild card here. Let's talk about the outdoor structures. I think it, I believe it, it ends in uh, September. Mm -hmm. Do we keep going? Yeah, I think we do. I mean, I, I I do think that we have to be careful. We have to always, as I said before, prioritize accessibility. We need to make sure that our streets are still usable and our streets are still usable for people with wheelchairs. I do not think um, that these structures belong on every street permanently, but I but I do think that we that past the fall we are still going to be in this. I'm just going to quickly say, because I know we're not talking about it anymore, but I think that we do need to be creative about our ideas for how to fill these vacant storefronts. Okay. And I do think that um, I'm very proud to have the endorsement of our former Manhattan Chamber of Commerce president, Nancy Plager, a proud Upper East Sider. Because of this very issue, we've been talking a lot about vacant storefronts, how we create smaller spaces, how we, how we uh, try to entice uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses to fill these spaces. We do not need any large walk block size Dwayne Reed spaces or TD banks that are the only thing that can fill those spaces. We need to be thinking creatively about how we support our entrepreneurs and bring them back to our city, bring them oh. back to our neighborhood. For outdoor dining, to me, it's about accessibility. I brought it up when we mentioned this at the community board recently, talking about the city council extending the program. Um, there are so many streets in our community throughout the city where if you're a wheelchair user, if you're a walker user, if you're a parent with a stroller, you can't fit on the public sidewalk. Me with my cane, based on my mobility, maybe I can take that step off the curb, but then we're putting pedestrians at risk by having them walk in traffic. So when we continue this program, because it has helped so many small businesses survive, let's be honest about that, it's been a lifeline for them during COVID, but we can't have their support and help for them be at the expense of pedestrians, seniors, disabled New Yorkers, parents, anyone. So I want to be sure that when we continue this program going forward after it ends as it is now in its current form in September, that we have much stronger accessibility requirements, we have much stronger streetscape rules around it. Um, right now it's just the regular eight foot DOT rule that applies, where from the business to the curb has to be eight feet of pedestrian space, but we all see it the second half of quarter in the East 80s, you can't even fit through me to my cape most often. So we absolutely have to have those issues taken into account. Marco, thoughts? I uh, you, you, you touched on it for a second. Yeah. Yes, uh, now I have to go deeper. Uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the issue is to support these outdoor dining structures. It's anti receiving community. Because as a minority, I know the rules and regulations they have to build. And all these structures are precarious in the, in the middle of the street. That any flooding, any strong winds, they can demolish, they can bring, they can completely uh, make them pieces. And those pieces will be flying in our neighborhood, destroying the, 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 the buildings. 
killing people and sometimes probably even hurt the people outside. And I think we have to assess the outdoor structure time to time and see if it's actually they need to have. Remember that right now the government released a lot of money for PPE. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I love outdoor gardening. I do want to see it continue. Um, and I echo the concerns of, of so many other folks here, obviously, with regards to accessibility, making sure not just that folks can get by on the street, but that the outdoor dining spaces themselves are accessible to people in, in wheelchairs um, and folks who have mobility issues, as well as the safety concerns that, that Marco brought up. Um, but I do think it's a program that's been a lifeline for so many small businesses, and I think it is something that is absolutely worth continuing. Um, and I will just say, you know, hearing uh, Ronnie talk about O'Flanagan sort of made me think about, you know, for example, the local restaurant in my neighborhood where my now husband and I for the first time talked about getting married and realized that saving these businesses is not just um, an economic proposal, it's about an emotional connection that we have to so many of these places. Um, that's why they're important to us and I think that's why it's so important that we do everything in our power um, to try to protect and save so many of these beloved local mom and pops that we have. Good. So I support the outdoor dining program got to get it right. We've gone through a very tough year. This was a lifeline for businesses. But this is why I support the director of the public realm to try to coordinate and consolidate agencies to bring some sense to what the structures are supposed to look like to make sure there is accessibility on our streets. Um, but this is all interconnected to what we've been talking about. You know, I read Jane Jacobs, you read about having eyes on the street, having a sense of community, a sense of place that does contribute to public safety. I think these outdoor dining structures have brought that eye, the eyes and energy onto the street, I think it's incredibly important. And if I may, with my remaining time, just talk about what to do about these vacancies. One, I think we need to do have open culture, look at uh, plugging in the arts to some of these vacancies, and also looking at whether any of them could be helpful for expanding 3K, pre-K, universal child care. Two, I think we need a vacancy tax on landlords that are kicking out their tenants and not in a good faith way uh, filling the vacancies. And this brings me to the last point. We have a rig system. Two, for too many landlords, they benefit the tax code for keeping a property vacant, or even worse, this connects to issues we care about here. Time. If it's in the bottom of the tenant building, they make it vacant so that they can ultimately tear down the building and put up a super dome. Julie? So I agree we should keep outdoor dining. I completely agree, though, we have to address accessibility issues and other issues, and that absolutely has to happen. On retail vacancy, we actually have double the amount of vacant retail space uh, in the past 10 years. So this was a problem before COVID, it has clearly been exacerbated by COVID. We had the same problem after 9-11 downtown, and Project created a program called Art Downtown after 9-11, where we programmed uh, vacant uh, retail spaces with cultural uses. We uh, created gallery spaces, artist studios, and programmed them. We should also look in the Upper East Side of doing that, but also look at 3K, 3K in particular. We have three sites for on the Upper East Side, totally unacceptable, so we need to look at that. We should look at co-working spaces. Can we make these spaces co-working spaces? We have to think outside of the box in terms of what we can do. And then lastly, I do believe um, we need our uh, city's tourism arm, NYC company. I used to serve in their executive board. They have to do a lot more to promote our small businesses on the Upper East Side. Right now they're doing a $30 million tourism campaign, but we need things that are also more hyper-local and targeted specifically to small businesses. Chris, final word on this one? Sure. Uh, let's start with uh, open dining. So yeah. I agree entirely with Rebecca. Um, my sister uh, has a, a degenerative tissue disorder, so sometimes she's able to walk, sometimes she's not able to walk. And these, uh, the way the streets are currently laid out, it would be impossible to navigate certain streets at all on certain days for her. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we're, we're in a community with an extremely large senior population. Seniors should not be having to trip over chairs in the streets. So there, there is a way to uh, sustain this, but we need to create a, a more standardized system that uh, very clearly makes room for people who need to use the streets. And uh, on the vacancy, as Julie was just saying, this problem way predates COVID. Uh, and I think that we have a tendency to talk about it in relation to COVID because it exacerbated and sped it up so much. But uh, in reality, this was the direction our economy has been going for the entirety of the time that I've lived in New York. So we, we need to have real conversations about the type of economy that we want to rebuild because if we build back the exact same system we had before, we're going to end up with lots of big box stores and lots of big storefronts.
All right, guys, so we're going to do one more question, and then we'll have some closing statements. Uh, it's, this has been wonderful. So let's hit education real quick. We'll start with Chris. What do you think about redistricting uh, the redistricting? I always have trouble with that word. I can't say aluminum, cinnamon. What's the synonym for synonym? Okay. Um, what the school district for middle and high school, and also, if you can touch a little bit, I know this is something I, I as a graduate of Stuyvesant High School, I know this. What should be done about the SH, SAT? Um, I, my, I take a position on the SH, SAT that uh, maybe a little controversy at the table, and I, I oppose it. I think it increases the amount of segregation in our system, and I don't believe it's a good metric for children. Uh, I actually come from an unusual educational background. I was homeschooled until college. Oh, okay. And part of the reason for that is that um, we were not able to trust the public school systems where I grew up with either my welfare or my education. And we need to ensure that um, we're properly funding our education system. There's a series of reforms that need to be implemented around equity. And we, we're not doing right by our kids right now. Some of the best schools in the city are on the Upper East Side, but we still deal with high levels of segregation. And until we desegregate the schools, we're, we're teaching children the, the color of their skin it has something to do with their value. And until we change the systems that, uh, that assess our children's academic performance to be reflective of their merit and not, um, frankly, predetermined uh, outcomes based on the resources they had access to before they took the test. Time. Uh, Julie? So when I chaired community board one after 9-11, I'm proud to have led the charge to build three new public schools, including the city's first green school. Um, in terms of the question you asked, Roger, first of all, I want to start with G&T programs at the youngest of ages. I support G&T. I think they need to be expanded, though, to a more diverse and wider audience throughout the whole city, not just this district, but citywide. On specialized high schools, I believe the test should be one component, along with essays, along with teacher recommendations, along with grades. You can't just have a test. I believe we need to diversify these schools, and one way to do that is to keep the test, but have it as one of the components. Um, and I do also want to say, I'm really proud in this race to have the endorsement of the teachers' union and CSA, which represents um, our principals, our administrators, because of my two-decade track record working on education issues. Bill? I'm proud to have the endorsement in this race of the University of Kids Pack. Kids Pack is a group of public school parents that are fighting for equity, smaller class sizes, and better funding in our schools. I'm also proud to have the endorsement of students throughout our district, including one who's one of the only black students at Eleanor Roosevelt High School, who could tell you herself what it's like to be one of the only black students at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. Um, we have uh, deeply segregated high schools and to a certain extent middle schools because of school screens. Some of these screens are, I think, very clearly causing that segregation, such as looking at uh, lateness, for example, as a measure. Um, but, but other screens are also feeling it as well. So I think we have to listen to our children. And even, uh, this may surprise a lot of people, and even their parents who are also agreeing that we need to diversify our schools, like Eleanor Roosevelt. And if you ask the principal at Eleanor Roosevelt High School, this is something that he's been pushing for years. Uh, on the SHSAT, I think with Julie, you know, it shouldn't just come down to one test. Uh, I think that's incredibly unfair to a student. Uh, I think a more holistic measure is not just fair, but it's going to result in a more diverse, uh, specialized uh, high school system. I think it's Stuyvesant where uh, only eight of the students uh, are black. Um, we should all be disturbed by that. We should all be trying to find adequate solutions. Yeah, so to, to echo a lot of what Billy and just said, I, I agree. The notion that one test taken at one time should dictate your educational future is uh, absurd to me. Um, I believe other factors need to be taken into account. I know that Keith Powers has a proposal on this that would uh, keep the test, but also include um, other factors as well, including uh, you know admitting a certain percentage of top students at every school in the uh, city, which I think would be a way to help segregate our schools and give all kids an opportunity um, to have some of the best educations. But I also think operating from a scarcity model um, is a problem. This notion that we have this limited number of quote unquote really good schools and that kids are forced into the situation where they have to compete with each other to get into these schools is terrible. We need to be investing in our public education. We need to be investing so that all of our schools are considered good schools. And so there isn't this incredible competition between all of our students, which creates inevitable tension um, between parents, between students. Um, so I believe that we need to be investing in education. But to the specific question about the test, no, I do not think that one test should determine whether or not a child gets into a school and determines their educational future. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. 
one desk is wrong. We need smaller classes. We need to build more classes. We need universal literacy by the third grade. We need to have uh, uh, remedial classes, especially after the pandemic. When the schools are open, I think we will have a big deficit of our, from our children in education because most of them, I don't think they will be very successful watching the classes on the internet. I think we really need a plan for them. Thank you. Rebecca. I also support changes to the specialized high school entrance exam. I think the one test metric just disenfranchises so many students and creates a great deal of stress as well in students for that one test to be what gets you into a few of these coveted good schools. One of the big, biggest powers of the city council is our budget. And I want to use that budget to have it be a statement of values and principles where we're valuing students, we're valuing educators, because we can't talk about students without talking about teachers, the adults in their building, and supporting them as well. So I want us to use the foundation aid, the billions of dollars finally being released from Albany to more equitably fund schools. There are some communities like ours that can raise billions of dollars from strong parent-teacher networks, and not every community has that. And that's why you see communities without before and after school programs, without arts programs, STEM, without social workers in every school, school nurses. So we need to also be looking at our budget as a part of desegregating schools and how we're giving more money to schools in black and brown communities and low-income communities that don't have textbooks, that don't have the basic needs that so many students in our neighborhood take for granted. And outside of that, I agree with something Kim said, how we can't just force students to a few coveted good schools. Every school should be a palace. Every school should be a place where every New York child can get a good education. And without that, we're setting students up for failure. And I firmly believe every student can succeed, but right now our system isn't built for that. And so as a parent and as a former public school social worker, I, I will say that I feel very passionately about uh, our schools and our public school education system. I think that ultimately we need to be working off of this idea, and which isn't as much of an idea as it is in law, that every child, regardless of his or her or their ability, must have the their academic needs met in our public school system. And right now we are failing most of our students, um, truly. Um, I, I think that when it comes to disparities in our, our education system, which Kim and Rebecca have talked about, I 100% agree. I can say firsthand that they are there. I also think that when it comes to the specific question of specialized school, high schools, um, I think that we do need to look, take a portfolio approach to this, looking at uh, test scores, looking at teacher recommendations, looking at attendance, looking at a whole wide range of factors. I agree with Marco that class size matters and that when we have smaller class sizes, we're able to give our students more individualized care. And I will just say that at the end of the day, I believe very truly deeply that, that diversity matters, that, that um, we are stronger when we are more diverse, but I truly believe that that happens through housing policy, frankly. And I think that so much of this comes back to how do we create diverse communities and it doesn't happen unless we build affordability. Finally, I'm just going to say that, again, as a public school social worker, I am particularly sensitive to our students who have IEPs and our, um, I've spoken to parents every day whose students have not had their IEPs met. Um, they are more like suggestions uh, right now in our city than actual mandates, which is wrong. Um, and we really need to be thinking about as we build a stronger and I hope and, and I hope more equitable education system that we really prioritize the needs of those students who have specialized learning needs. Perfect. Well, yeah, it is, I'll tell you, you guys want to see some interesting comments go on like you know, Facebook page for Stuyvesant and Tech Bomb Science. I could personally attest, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It really is, it's, boy, what a time. All right, here we go. Uh, everyone, uh, please describe your role in a preservation effort you were involved with before this particular run for office. Pinpoint your top two accomplishments that you have tangibly benefited this district and the city at large. And I guess let's go back to the original plan. You want to start with, we'll go back out that board and start with Bill. Great, so one effort that I was proud to be part of in standing shoulder to shoulder with uh, public housing residents at uh, Holmes House and Isaac's Houses uh, was opposing the Fetner Infill uh, project. Um, this was a plan to take the playground away um, from the HF tenants and put up a super tall building uh, that had a huge amount of market rate luxury apartments. Um, this was wrong for several reasons, but one of which was it was essentially taking the scarce open space that we have in our neighborhood, we've already talked about it, uh, but more importantly, taking away open space from public housing residents to fund public housing needs, a need that the government already has an obligation to 
fulfilled. Uh, we stopped this at the community board level, passed resolutions, we stood shoulder to shoulder with NYCHA, um, and I'm really proud to have been a part of that. Uh, a couple of accomplishments. One is I've been at the forefront of a lot of fights over open space and how do we use uh, our outdoor public space. Uh, most recently, advocating for pedestrianizing the Queensboro Bridge south of the roadway, something that we're finally doing to make it a more walkable, bikeable bridge. It's going to be crucial for people who rely on, on that bridge to get to their work. It's going to be crucial for people who are just trying to go over the road. Uh, and then another uh, thing that I'm very proud of, of is uh, constituent services. Uh, whether it's my role as a junior board member of the ISA Center, helping people in need, helping get our seniors fed, or whether it's responding to constituents um, who simply come in and say, hey, you know, I've got a surprise medical building issue, I need some help, and I'm able to deliver that help for people. I'm incredibly proud uh, to have been able to do that, whether it's as a community board member, uh, someone serving on the Isaac Center Junior Board, uh, or other roles to be serving our neighbors in need. And I'm proud because I think that's the key role of a city council member. Constituent services is the number one uh, part of the job. You know, Mayor have already said there's no democratic or Republican way of cleaning the street, and that's how I feel about a lot of the most basic fundamental duties of being a city council member. That's why I'd be proud and honored to serve as your next council member. Thanks a lot, Billy. Uh, Rebecca, you're up. I'm proud to have worked with the Homes Isaacs Coalition, uh, community members in NYCHA at Homes and Isaacs to oppose the Fetner Infill project. Our community was facing the very first infill proposal. Infill is where NYCHA takes public land, in this case it was a children's park, to put up market rate private development where it wouldn't be saved for residents in Homes and Isaacs now dealing with uninhabitable apartments that need serious repairs. And so I'm proud to have authored resolutions. I'm proud to have marched with the coalition to Gracie Mansion to have designed flyers for them, help facilitate meetings they did to help oppose this project. And I'm proud that all of us together with people here now with me, that we were able to be back these sources of privatization at NYCHA, of this displacement of NYCHA tenants and neighbors in our community. So that's a very big campaign on preservation I'm proud to have been a part of. Outside of that, for other tangible accomplishments in the community, for me, honestly, it's about accessibility, how I've injected into every conversation. At the community board, when we talk about buses, I'm bringing up accessibility with our kneeling buses. That's one of the only accessible forms of transportation for so many community members. When we talk about bike lanes, when we talk about placard abuse and people can handicap parking permits with placard abuse from other city agencies and New Yorkers. I'm also really proud of the work I've done to promote safer communities and safer work environments. It's not something that has been hyper local to this community, but it was a law I got passed down at City Hall called the Construction Safety Act, which implemented worker safety training, mostly for non-union, undocumented New Yorkers that were dying at alarming rates on construction projects. And unsafe constructions not only hurts workers, but it hurts community members, where just two years ago, a woman in our neighborhood was hit by a beam falling off the side of an unsafe development down in Midtown, and also on 88th Street a few years back, where a worker lost their life on a market rate luxury housing project. So it's real in our community, and I'm proud to have passed that law down at City Hall to protect workers. Thanks, Rebecca. Here we go. I think we're going about like a two on this one. So, uh, Julie. So you first asked about a preservation effort that we have been involved in. So I'm going to focus on one that I did many years ago uh, on the rezoning of Northern Tribeca, which I did as chair of Community Board One. We rezoned Northern Tribeca to preserve its contextual character, but also to build affordable housing and to limit big box retail. So we were able to limit the square footage of retail so that we were really able to promote the mom and pops. And that was used as a model years later on the Upper West Side, but then followed our suit and did the same thing. Um, I also am a longtime board member of the Municipal Arts Society. We were involved uh, along, obviously, with Friends, who was the leader on this, of the Upper East Side Historic District and expanding it to 75 buildings. In terms of proudest two accomplishments that have helped the district and the city, I would focus on two. First, as Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, I lowered fines on small businesses by one third. So you heard about San Mateo's earlier, that's a business, and we were able to lower fines, allow them to cure the violation first. We helped hundreds of small businesses, and we increased consumer restitution by 70%, meaning thousands of people on the Upper East Side got more money back. I also launched a paid sick leave law and created NYC Kids Rise and seeded 13,000 kids with a college savings account. And then secondly, the census. I was the city census director. We partnered with groups like Stanley Isaac Center to have a record response on the census. We meet almost every other major city, and that specifically delivered $2,600 of benefits per person on the east side, $6,000 per family on the census. 
Thanks, Shirley. Uh, Kim, up, you're up. So in terms of a preservation effort, I was really proud to offer testimony in support of landmarking 412 East 85th Street. Um, it's a street that I used to live on, and it's one of the few remaining um, wood houses in all of Manhattan. Um, obviously, they don't open anymore because of the fire risk, but this is a building that I used to walk by every day um, that I absolutely loved. And when I found out that it was on the list to potentially be considered a landmark, I not only uh, submitted testimony in support, but I like, tried to rally the community around it. I sent out emails and encouraged other people to submit testimony as well. So I was extremely glad to find out um, that it ultimately was landmark tonight, and I think that is something that I'm very proud of in terms of preservation in the city. In terms of uh, accomplishments that I am proud of overall, um, I mentioned this before, but my work in founding Yorkville by local, um, I'm very proud of that effort. Um, that came out of a forum that I hosted with my co-district leader, Ben Wetzler, talking about making storefronts. And we realized that there were very little um, resources for small business owners in terms of really promoting and protecting. Um, and I had done work with um, by local East Harlem uh, as well. And so we utilized their model to create one for Yorkville, which has been extremely successful. Had several small business owners who have given testimonials in support of our campaign and have specifically mentioned Yorkville by local as something that has demonstrably helped their business in the last couple of years. So I'm extremely proud of that. The other thing I'm very proud of is my work as Legislative Committee Chair for New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. I lobbied uh, at the legislature in Albany in support of Nicholas's law, which would require that any guns that are in a home with a child uh, be locked away. And so when that bill finally passed in 2019, due to the you know, advocacy of, of groups like New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, I was extremely proud. And I know for a fact that people in this city and children in this city are safer because of that bill that we advocated for and lobbied for so hard. So those are the things that I am most proud of here. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Trisha? So if you know me, then you know that I can't generally get through one conversation without talking about our East River Esplanade. Uh, for me, taking care of the Esplanade has not been a piece of advocacy. It's been a part of who I am. It's a part of who my family is. We have spent over a decade fighting to preserve this open space. Uh, as Deputy Chief of Staff to Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, as the co-chair of the Parks and Waterfront Committee, as the former board member of Friends of the East River Esplanade, you name the role, I've done it. When it comes to advocating for this waterfront, I was the first person on site when the Esplanade collapsed. Last summer in July, I personally taped off the area while Parks, Parks Committee member of Parks employees came to meet me and um, make sure that everybody kept the area safe. I will continue to fight until we have a waterfront that our community needs and deserves, period. When it comes to preservation, I'm very proud to have joined Billy, Rebecca, and Marco in fighting against the privatization of NYCHA. I don't think that we can emphasize enough how bad of a precedent this sets when the city thinks that it can privatize and sell off its biggest priority to the highest bidder. I will continue to fight against privatization and will continue to fight to hold government officials of, uh, accountable for funding NYCHA and keeping uh, these tenants safe. Finally, again, I will say that as Deputy Chief of Staff to Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, one of my biggest accomplishments that I am forever going to be proud of is a small but meaningful role that I played in getting in, uh, getting through Phase 1 of the 2nd Avenue subway. As Carolyn's Deputy Chief of Staff, I held meetings. We held weekly, if not daily, meetings with MTA officials. We uh, stood behind our small businesses, helped them rally, helped uh, create different programming opportunities to help them survive, held countless rat academies. I can't even tell you how many that we held, trying to keep our uh, neighborhood going, trying to um, get them to believe in government again and believe that we can get something as large as the Second Avenue subway finished. So I'm very proud of that. Christopher Sosa. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's a two-part question, I believe. The first was on preservation. Do you want me to reiterate? Or? No, I think I did that. Uh, so on the first, um, in my previous life before government, uh, I was a full-time journalist and also I worked in advocacy. And one of the organizations I worked for focused on uh, issues including wildlife preservation, open space preservation, and infrastructure preservation and improvements, including for people who are in water and secure places. So that was a, a huge part of my life. In terms of specific accomplishments that apply to New Yorkers, uh, there are two that I'm especially proud of. One is the passage of the New York State Dream Act. Uh, I worked in the Democratic Caucus of the New York State Senate, and as most of you know, uh, the original sponsor of that bill died suddenly of undiagnosed leukemia. And after his passage, uh, the after he passed, the passage of that bill was somewhat in question because it, of course, needed to file with the lead sponsor, and so forth. So I served on the team that got the law over the finish line, and now uh, thousands of kids are going to college who previously would not have been able to under the old 
counseling system. In addition to that, uh, I worked with CUNY Law School uh, on a pilot program for district offices that brought housing and immigration attorneys for free to, uh, to residents who were not able to afford them. It was a really successful program, and I look forward to implementing it in my own office, should I be elected. Perfect. And last but not least, to, uh, to wrap it up, uh, okay, Mr. Marco, go for it. Thank you. As an architect, expert in historical preservation, with my skill, I was involved in fighting to preserve our historical and cultural heritage in our community for 12 years. As a, me as a member of the community, uh, uh, Committee, Madame Marx, I'm sorry. One project I was involved was the Park Avenue Historical District, whose director is Michel Birmar. This historical district covered from 79th Street to 86th Street. I, was, I am proud that I testified a landmark commission's board in this park, in this park, on this project. I have to mention two more things now. I'm the only one candidate that present a new resilient esplanade. Because right now, the section that is called uh, Esplanade between 81st Street to 62nd Street, this is a lot and this is wrong, and it has been putting just only flowers. And the conditions are extremely serious. What I'm proposing is to build a seawall of 11 feet. That is the FEMA required to, in order to avoid the flooding and erosion of the uh, FDR as well as some buildings. In addition, in the, on the top of that, what used to, the, what used to be the path, I'm going to put a cycle, a bicycle uh, exercise place. And on the top of that, continue the deck I'm planning to build an incentive uh, view for the whole uh, east side of, the, of our district, creating more spaces for our community, which basically most of them, uh, uh, some of them, they already mentioned that we have a crisis, but not on them, that solution. That's my solution for that part. We respect with... Uh, About 30 seconds left. Oh. Uh, with respect to uh, NYCHA, I, I'm the only one that I have a plan for affordable housing. Increasing density, I can improve the quality of life of 534 people and reach 2,056 affordable units. And with that decision, I will, I will save millions of dollars from the taxpayers in order to buy vacant lot. Thank you very much, Marco. Well, would you like to uh, have some closing remarks? Yes, uh, uh, Roger. Uh, I have three comments. Uh, Roger, you, you've done an outstanding job. Oh, it's, nice. it's been like a marathon, but, <laughs> but you've led us through it. Oh, that was a blast. And nobody talks much about food today. <laughs> 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 Joanna picked you out. She said, we've got to get Roger. Oh, yeah. So, thank, you. thank you, Joanna. Thank you. And finally, for our, um, our candidates, uh, I think people living in District 5 can rest assured that there will be a great council member. And uh, you, you know, you, you wish, I wish that each and every one of you could do could take over the job, but reality being what it is. But I, I just felt so good about the great feeling between the candidates and the spirit of cooperation that exists. And I think I think it bodes well for the future. And I know all of you will stay involved. I'm convinced of that. Thank you, and thank you everyone, and thank our co-sponsors for this for this wonderful event.